Um, Mr Speaker, yesterday marked the 35th Bill Relief Scheme. The right honourable gentleman, of course, is perfectly right that people are anxious about this, and I regret that today I can't give an exact date. We do look forward to Bayes making a statement. Peter Gyle. Uh, thank you. I hope he will be encouraging his colleagues in Bayes because it is already winter and 60 per cent of homes are being heated by heating oil and they need that support right now. In Britain, heating oil bills have risen from £615 to £1,500. But in Northern Ireland, it's risen from £820 to a staggering £1,900. Did you think it's fair that both are getting the same £100 payment? No, yeah, not fair. I'm, I'm most grateful. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, and I have taken this up with our counterparts in Bayes. We do so frequently and intensively. And my right honourable friend has just said to me, I think it was Thursday, that he met with the Energy Minister. And we will continue to press colleagues in Bayes. I know that they are fully aware of the situation and the imperatives. Um, but I have to say, um, a, a full answer on the justification for the £100 would, I think, meet with Mr. Speaker's disapproval at this moment. Okay. We now go to Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Mr Speaker, the Minister rightly uh, said that the union is both uh, a political and an economic union. Uh, in the uh, High Court and the Court of Appeal, in respect of the Northern Ireland Protocol and its application, the Government's lawyers argued that the Protocol superseded Article 6 of the Act of Union itself, which uh, is the basis for the economic union. Will the Government uh, and the Minister assure us that in any negotiations with the European Union, they will strive to restore our full rights under Article 6 of the Act of Union and our place in the UK internal market. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful to the right honourable gentleman for the opportunity to commit that, yes, this government is determined to restore the constitutional position of Northern Ireland fully within the United Kingdom. That is our intention. I can't get into the niceties of the uh, legal arguments that were made, but if I may say so, I think, as I understand it, they're broadly technical. Sir Geoffrey. Um, can I also uh, uh, refer to the comments made by the Shadow Secretary of State uh, and uh, raise the energy support uh, scheme, the £400 that is to be allocated to the electricity accounts of uh, domestic households and non-domestic uh, businesses and so on in Northern Ireland? Uh, I have spoken with the Secretary of State at Bayes uh, to urge that this uh, payment is brought forward in good time. Uh, will the Minister assure me that he will continue in his efforts uh, with us to ensure that the £400 payment is made to the people of Northern Ireland as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah. We certainly will continue in those efforts together. I'm grateful that he's had meetings with the Secretary of State. Um, I hope he won't mind me saying, though, and of course I understand the reasons why he's not in the executive, and that's why we wish to press forward on the protocol. But I, I must say that matters would be somewhat easier if there was a functioning executive in place. Dan Jarvis. Number three, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you. Um, this government is united around our shared objective of, adge uh, of addressing the legacy of Northern Ireland's past in a way that delivers for those directly impacted by the Troubles and helps society in Northern Ireland to move forwards. As the Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Re Reconciliation Bill continues its parliamentary passage, I can assure the Honourable Gentleman that my officials and I will continue to work closely with colleagues across government and across the House to ensure this legislation is effective and durable. Dan Jarvis. It was good to see the Secretary of State visited the Wave Trauma Centre, and I know that that will have focused his mind on the perspective of victims. I also know that this is a very complex and difficult piece of legislation to get right, but the Secretary of State will also know that, as drafted, the Bill does not have the support of any of the parties in Northern Ireland. Given that we now have a new Prime Minister and a new Secretary of State, does he see an opportunity to progress the Bill in a way that will bring people with the Government? Yeah. Um, I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for his, his uh, supplementary, and the answer is basically yes. Um, the Government understands how important addressing the legacy of the past is for Northern Ireland. We recognise that the Bill is difficult for many, and continue to engage with stakeholders like WAVE and across the, uh, across the piece regarding uh, their concerns and how we can address them um, as the Bill proceeds through Parliament. I hope he recognises, though, that there is no perfect solution to this issue. And we are committed to a way forward that deals with Northern Ireland's troubled past as comprehensively and fairly as we possibly can. Tim Sunderland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I please ask the Secretary of State when we might see the Legacy Bill back in this place, and also whether there will be a necessary review of moral equivalence and terminology? Um, I, the, 
I thank the honourable gentleman for his question. The government is clear, actually, uh, that we will never accept any moral equivalence between those who upheld the law in Northern Ireland and those on all sides who sought to destroy it. This legislation seeks to deliver better outcomes for all those most affected by the Troubles. And it's important to remember that this includes the families of service personnel, over 1,000 of whom were killed during the Troubles. The Government will continue to engage with those most directly impacted in the legislation on their concerns and how these might be addressed. Uh, the second reading of the Legacy Bill in uh, the House of Lords will take place in a couple of weeks' time. Speaker, has the Secretary of State accepted the cold, hard fact that the final outcome of the Legacy Bill needs to have the support of innocent victims and relatives yeah, yeah. of those murdered yeah, yeah. by terrorists to have any legitimacy whatsoever, just as in the wider political realm any outcome of protocol talks needs to have the support across the community, or it too will be doomed to failure? Um, yes, I absolutely do understand that point. Um, and certainly, the legacy, uh, everything that we have been doing uh, since I became Secretary of State is to try and engage uh, and, and consult more with those who had issues with the Legacy Bill. As I say, it's, this is never going to be a perfect solution to, the, uh, to this particular problem because no perfect solution exists. However, we will do our best to address all the concerns that people raise with us. Chair of the Select Committee, Salmon Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a, a welcome bill, and it's obviously a complex bill. Could my right honourable friend uh, assure me that the government would indeed see it through to the end? Will he confirm that this legislative proposal is very much the last chance saloon? These are very complex and historical issues, and this is the one chance that we have to try and resolve it. But in that spirit of trying to build compromise and consensus, will he and the government keep an open mind to cross-party amendments in the other place? Um, I thank uh, the Chairman of the Select Committee for his question. I, 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 and I can, I mean, I, I'm quite sure this is the last legislative vehicle that any government will try to address this problem with. So I, I, I do think it's very important and it's incumbent on, on me as Secretary of State to ensure that we do use um, all the time that we have to improve the bill in, in such a way as he suggests. And yes, I'm listening to all parties and uh, and all, all the consultees that we, that we talk to and going out and visiting victims and victims groups in Northern Ireland to try and get a better uh, gauge of what sort of amendments would improve this bill. Shadow Minister Tony Antony. Mr Speaker, the Joint Committee on Human Rights have now declared that this bill is unlikely to be found compatible with Convention rights. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission have called it fatally flawed. Does the Secretary of State dispute this or will he make changes to it? I'm going to make changes to it. Please twist. For Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With permission, I'll answer questions 4 and 10 together. We are acutely aware of the pressures facing the health service uh, in Northern Ireland. A fully functioning devolved government is the only way to deliver the necessary reforms to transform health care. We've made this point repeatedly to party leaders. Ms Twist. Thank you. Um, around one in four people in Northern Ireland are on an NHS waiting list, and the role of staff is vitally important. Now, I understand that the outgoing Health Minister wrote to the Secretary asking him to implement the Summer Pay Award, as Stormont can't. Will he be taking this forward? Yeah. 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 I'm most grateful to her. Um, she will know that we're deeply concerned about the state of uh, finances of the Northern Ireland Executive, and officials are working urgently with the Northern Ireland Civil Service to take things uh, forwards. Um, we will, of course, keep matters under review, but I have to say to her that with health being a devolved matter, the best way forward would be a restoration of the executive. Sir Tony Lloyd. Speaker, the, um, two, two years ago, the, 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 the health minister, Robin Swan, who did such a good job, actually, averted industrial action by nurses by making sure that there was comparability between pay for nurses in, in Northern Ireland with those in England and Wales. Yeah, yeah. Now, the Northern Ireland Fiscal Council says that next year the budget for, for health will be 2% below what it is this year. Will the Minister guarantee there will be money now to pay the nurses without whom 
we will not have any impact on these dreadful waiting lists. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm very grateful to him because, of course, the recommendations of the independent review bodies, which have responsibility for determining pay for health workers, were published in July 2022. <laughs> the Minister for Health was unable to implement the recommended pay increases because there had not been a wider executive decision on public sector pay. Pay parity with NHS England had been restored after a Northern Ireland wide strike in 1920, but the absence of an executive has now seen pay divergence occur again. And Mr. Speaker, finally, I just say gently to him that the UK Government is providing £121 per person for the executive for every £100 of equivalent UK Government spending over the Spending Review 21 period to deliver public services in Northern Ireland. I have to say, I think his constituents and mine would think that was quite generous funding. Alexander Stafford. Question five, please, Speaker. Uh, Alexander Stafford. Mr. Speaker, uh, the government is committed to ensuring businesses can trade freely throughout the United Kingdom, so our approach has two strands. Under the protocol, by, by the end of the year, we will, I, I'm sorry to say, have spent £340 million helping traders to process 2.3 million customs declarations through the Trader Support Service for trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. This, of course, uh, vividly uh, illustrates the problems with the protocol, and that's why, as I've said earlier, we're in constructive dialogue to deliver on change and why we continue to keep the protocol bill before Parliament. Alexander Thank you, Mr Speaker. Northern Ireland boasts some of the UK's most innovative businesses, but what steps is he taking to ensure that Northern Irish businesses are placing environmental, social and government considerations at the heart of their operations? And does he agree with me that cementing Northern Ireland's place as a global leader in ESG will stimulate regional jobs and growth and turbocharge investment in the province and across the UK? Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right that Northern Ireland boasts some of the UK's most innovative businesses, and he's absolutely right that it's a fantastically attractive place uh, to invest. An increasing number of organisations in Northern Ireland report on environmental, social and governance standards. I regularly visit businesses in Northern Ireland, as does my right honourable friend, and we will continue to take an interest in their approach to ESG. Stephen Farray. What businesses in Northern Ireland want alongside their political stability is dual market access. So as well as working to ensure that businesses have access to the rest of the UK market, will the Minister ensure that the access to the European market will be, will be preserved and the government will do nothing to compromise that? We are committed to maintaining that dual market access and we hope to negotiate a position with the European Union where that is possible whilst preserving the east-west uh, strand of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. We do want to restore the constitutional status of Northern Ireland whilst ensuring that market access, and I very much hope we'll do so by negotiation. SNP spokesperson Richard Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I take this opportunity to associate myself and my party with the remarks that the Secretary of State made about the 35th anniversary of the bombing in Enniskillen, and our thoughts are very much with all who continue to be affected by that event to, to this day. Maris Sefcovic has said that uh, issues around the Northern Ireland Protocol could be resolved in a couple of weeks if sufficient political will was to be found. Does the Secretary of State understand the political damage that has been caused by the failure of the Government to begin negotiations on this earlier in the year? And will he commit to doing all he can to achieving a negotiated settlement on this before this year is out? I shall have to answer procedurally, but of course we understand the political implications of where we are, most significantly, of course, if I may say so, the collapse of the institutions because of the legitimate concerns of unionism and the DUP in particular. But that is why I and the Secretary of State have been very clear that we recognise the legitimate interests of all parties, including the European Union and Ireland, and it is why we are resolute on our own interests as the United Kingdom. Now, of course, if we were to completely concede our interests, we would achieve a deal within weeks. But the point is this country and this government are humble in accepting the legitimate interests of the EU, re resolute in defending our own. I very much hope that we will reach a negotiated settlement. Number six, please, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I engage regularly with Northern Ireland parties. Indeed, I spoke to executive party leaders uh, the more only this morning, 
and will continue to keep my cabinet, cabinet colleagues fully appraised of these discussions. Mr Speaker, the Secretary of State told the Northern Ireland Committee that he would be calling an election on, and I quote, one minute past midnight on the 28th of October. But this didn't happen, and it has left Northern Ireland in limbo. Reports have since emerged that the Northern Ireland Secretary was directly overruled by the Prime Minister. Can he confirm if this is true, or did he mean to intentionally mislead a parliamentary committee? Yes, yes. Um, I don't believe I was overruled by the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker. Sir Oliver Hill. Uh, Mr Speaker, at the... At the UK uh, EU Parliamentary Partnership Assembly, which you kindly opened uh, this week, uh, we were able to discuss the situation in uh, Northern Ireland, the protocol and the talks, and voices were raised from across Europe and from this House in all parts, encouraging the Government and the Commission to reach an agreement because this is the gateway to cooperation on so many other things. And so I'd just like to commend the Minister on having the talks and say let's get a decision. Um, I thank uh, the, my right hon. Friend for the work he does on, on the Assembly. Um, it is a vital new institution, new committee. It has, it has deep roots um, in the European Parliament as well as in this Parliament, and it will add great value to our discussions. Ms Cunningham. Please. Mr Speaker, the UK Government is providing vital support to households and businesses across the UK uh, to help with the rising cost of energy. This is an issue the Secretary of State and I raise frequently with colleagues across government, including the Business Secretary and the Energy Minister. We seek to provide urgent support to households and businesses across Northern Ireland. Oh, yeah, Mr. Speaker, well, several times this morning the Minister has been asked about the £400 energy support payment. What is the blockage to making the payment now? When is it going to be sorted? Uh, yeah. He will, of course, understand that these schemes need to be de delivered by officials, and that, ha that effort has been hampered very substantially by not having a functioning executive. And I just say that, that we all should acknowledge that without an executive, these things are more difficult to deliver. We are well aware of the imperatives, as I said earlier, and once again I would urge all parties to reform the executive so that we can give people the prompt help that they deserve. Robin Walker. Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Peace and prosperity are intrinsically linked, and this Government is committed to delivering both to help Northern Ireland reach its full potential. I pay tribute to my honourable friend for his expert contribution to that end when he served in the Department. We are investing £730 million into the new Peace Plus programme. Uh, which will support economic growth and community cohesion. The Government also provides significant resource to tackle the threat from terrorism, para paramilitarism and organised crime. Walker, I saw for myself the growth and city deals offer a huge opportunity across every part of Northern Ireland to improve economic performance and, under, and strengthen society that underpins the peace process. Will my honourable friend agree that to maximise the benefit of those growth and city deals, we need the executive in place working hand in hand with the UK government? Well, Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right that our £617 million investment in city and growth deals presents a historic opportunity to generate innovation and growth across Northern Ireland, and he's right that we do need a functioning executive in place to drive forward that delivery. Karen Smith. Okay, right. This morning I met with the East Border Region, a cross-party, cross-border, local authority-led organisation developing peace and prosperity um, across the border. Will he agree to meet with them to discuss their work over the last 50 years? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly, Mr. Speaker, I'll be glad to meet. And if she would write to me, we'll take that up. Andrew Sudo, for nine, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the government is engaging in constructive dialogue with the European Union to find solutions to uh, the issues caused by the protocol. We are also proceeding with legislation, which aims to fix the practical problems the protocol has created in Northern Ireland in the event that we cannot reach our preferred negotiated solution. The Trader Support Service has helped thousands of businesses in Northern Ireland navigate the way in which goods move under the protocol. How will this uh, very important service be funded over the next year? Uh, both the Trader Support Service and the Movement Assistance Scheme provide support to traders moving goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
By the end of this year, we'd have spent £340 million helping traders process 2.3 million customs declarations through the Trader Support Service for trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. But we very much hope we can find a negotiated sol a solution to the protocol issues, which mean we do not have to spend this money in the future. Olson. The Northern Ireland Protocol has resulted in the ripping up of the Belfast Agreement, the principal consent and the fall of the Assembly. It has also imposed EU law on part of our country, and that law will be imposed by the European Court of Justice. Does the Minister accept you can't improve on that? You've got to remove it. Um, I thank the Honourable, right honourable gentleman for his question. Actually, I do think there is a negotiated path where you can completely change the, uh, how, we, how we deal with the, the protocol, which would mean that uh, it deals with the issues of governance, it deals with the issues of trade, um, and it deals with all the other practical issues that are causing legitimate concerns to the communities he represents. Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I'd like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on Permanent Live TV. We start with questions to Prime Minister Neil Coyle. Mr Speaker, with Armistice Day on Friday, I know that colleagues from across the House will want to join me in remembering those who have lost their lives in the service of our country. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others in addition to my duties in this House. I shall have further such meetings later today. Neil Coyle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The people I serve will, of course, be commemorating remembrance. Bermondsey was the original home of the Poppy Factory, providing work for injured veterans of the Great War over 100 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but, Mr Speaker, Covid restrictions were a necessary, if painful, experience. Across the country, most people made enormous sacrifices, like Charlotte, my constituents, and local councillor Lorraine, unable to see their mums in their final days. These people were betrayed by the Conservatives, who parted their way through lockdown. Oh. Covering. You may, you may not like it, but you can all go to eat kangaroo testicles for all I care. But those, those Conservatives covered Downing Street in suitcases of wine, in vomit and in fixed penalty notices. Can this Prime Minister promise today he will use his power of veto to ensure that no one who received an FPN for breaking Covid laws is rewarded with a seat in the House of Lords? Yeah. Well, I Mr. Mr. Mr Speaker, what I can say is that this government during COVID ensured that we protected people's jobs, yeah. that we supported the NHS to get through the difficult times, and that we rolled out the fastest vaccine in Europe. That's what we did for this country. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the commitments made by my right honourable friend at COP27 this week. If he wants to do something that really helps get us to net zero, improves our energy security and helps create new opportunities in places like Milford Haven, <laughs> South Wales, South West England. Can I urge him to really throw the full weight of his office behind delivering floating offshore wind yeah, in the yeah. Celtic Sea and crucially ensure that decisions being taken now <coughs> by the Crown Estate and the Treasury mean that the economic value, the jobs of this new industry stay here in the UK? Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I praise my right honourable friend for highlighting the incredible potential of floating offshore wind technology to help us move to net zero. Uh, he's right about the opportunities in the Celtic Sea and for Wales more generally, and I can confirm to him that Crown Estate's leasing process is expected to deliver more seabed leases for many more projects. Yeah. Of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his comments about Remembrance Day? Uh, we remember all those who paid the ultimate price and all those who have served and are serving our country. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the member for South Staffordshire told a civil servant to slit their throat. How does the Prime Minister think the victim of that bullying felt when he expressed great sadness at his resignation? Oh. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, unequivocally, the behaviour complained of was unacceptable, and it is absolutely right. It is absolutely right that the right honourable gentleman has resigned. For the record, I did not know about any of the specific concerns 
relating to his conduct as Secretary of State or Chief Whip, which date back some years. I believe that people in public life should treat others with consideration and respect, and those are the principles that this government will stand by. Mr Speaker, the member for South Staffordshire spent years courting the idea he can intimidate others, yeah. blurring the lines to normalise bullying behaviour. Yeah. It's precisely why the Prime Minister gave him a job. Yeah. The truth is simple. He's a pathetic bully, yeah. but he would never get away with it if people like the Prime Minister didn't hand him power. Yeah. So does he regret his decision to make him a government minister? Yes. Mr Speaker, I obviously regret appointing someone who has had to resign in these circumstances. But I think, but I think what the British people would like to know is that when situations like this arise, that they will be dealt with properly. And that's why... And that's why it is absolutely right that he resigned, and it's why it is absolutely right that there is an investigation to look into these matters properly. I said my government would be characterised by integrity, professionalism and accountability, and it will. Mr Speaker, everyone in the country knows someone like the member for South Staffordshire, a sad middle manager getting off on intimidating those beneath him. But everyone in the country also knows someone like the Prime Minister, the boss who is so weak, so worried the bullies will turn on him, that he hides behind them. What message does he think it sends when, rather than take on the bullies, he lines up alongside them and thanks them for their loyalty? Mr Speaker, the message that I clearly want to send is that integrity in public life matters. And that is why... That is why it is right that the right hon. Member has resigned. It is why it is right that there is a rigorous process to examine these issues. But as well as focusing on this one individual, it is also right and important that we keep delivering for the whole country. And that is why this Government will continue to concentrate on stabilising the economy, on strengthening the NHS and on tackling illegal migration. Those are my priorities. Those are the priorities of the British people, and this government will deliver on them. Mr. Speaker, the problem is he can't stand up to a run-of-the-mill bully, so he has no chance of standing up to vested interests on behalf of working people. Take Shell. They made record profits this year, £26 billion. How much have they paid under his so-called windfall tax? Mr Speaker, I was Chancellor who introduced an extra tax on the oil and gas companies. Right. But, but he talks, he talks, Mr Speaker, he talks about working people. The right honourable member voted against legislation to stop strikes disrupting working people. He voted, he voted against legislation to stop extremist protesters disrupting working people. That's because he's not on the side of working people, Mr Speaker. That's what the Conservatives are for. Mr Speaker, I'm, I'm against all of those causing chaos, damage to our public services and to our economy, whether they are gluing themselves to the road or sitting on the government benches. Mr Speaker, there was no answer to the question because the answer is nothing. Shell haven't paid a penny in windfall tax. Why? Because for every pound they spend digging for fossil fuels, he hands them a 90p tax break, and it's costing the taxpayer billions. So will he find a backbone and end his absurd oil and gas giveaway? Well, Mr Speaker, what the party opposite will never understand is that it's businesses investing that create jobs in this country. Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House, we understand that. We will support businesses to invest, to create jobs, because that's how we create prosperity, that's how we support strong public services, and that's what you get with a Conservative government. There's only one party that crashed the economy, and they're all sitting there. It's a 
a pattern. Mr Speaker, it's a pattern with this Prime Minister. Too weak to sack the security threats sat around the Cabinet table. Too weak to take part in a leadership contest after he lost the first one. Too weak to stand up for working people. He spent weeks flirting with the climate change deniers in his party, then scuttled off to COP at the last minute. In the Budget next week, he will be too weak to end his oil and gas giveaway, scrap the non-DOM tax breaks and end the farce of taxpayers subsidising private schools. That's what Labour would do, a proper plan for working people. Mr Speaker, if he can't even stand up to a cartoon bully with a pet spider, if he's too scared to face the public in an election, what chance has he got of running the country? We won't. Shh. We want to try and get through on time, and I know some members want to catch my eye. They're not doing a good job so far. Come on, Prime Minister. M- Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman talks about judgment about putting people around the Cabinet table. I would just gently remind him he thought the member for Islington North was the right person to look after our security. But, Mr. Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentleman, the Honourable Gentleman, he's. He said a lot today. He said a lot today, but it's clear that he isn't focused on the serious issues that are confronting our country. We're strengthening our economy. He's backing the strikers. We're supporting people with energy bills. He's supporting the protesters. And we're tackling illegal migration. He's opposing every measure. The British people want real leadership on the serious global challenges we face, and that's what they'll get from this government. Mr Speaker, 84 years ago today in Germany, hundreds of synagogues were destroyed, Torah schools were desecrated, thousands of Jewish businesses and and shops were destroyed as well. 91 Jewish people were murdered and later 30,000 Jewish men were sent to the concentration camps. So as we commemorate Kristallnacht, let us remember that it was started with anti-Jewish hatred It became anti-Semitism, and it's still prevalent in society today. So will my right hon. Friend condemn anti-Semitism in all its forms, but congratulate the Holocaust survivors who give their testimony year after year, and in particular congratulate the Holocaust Educational Trust for the brilliant work they do in making sure we will never, ever forget what happened in the Holocaust. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his powerful question and his continued work on this issue. Uh, I completely agree with him. Anti-Semitism has no place in our society, and we're taking a strong lead in tackling it in all forms. We became the first country to adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, and the government's independent adviser on anti-Semitism regularly provides advice to ministers on how best to tackle this issue. And can I join him, as I know the whole House will, in praising the work of those survivors who so bravely tell their stories so that we might never forget. Yeah. SNP leader Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister for Armistice? We remember those that paid the ultimate sacrifice, those that continue to serve, And we should also remember the nuclear test veterans who continue to seek justice for themselves. Mr Speaker, last night the Prime Minister suffered the self-inflicted loss of his first Cabinet Minister. A couple of weeks into the job, it turns out this Prime Minister's judgment is every bit as bad as his predecessors. Speaking of which, we now know that his former friend, the former Prime Minister, plans to hand out seats in the House of Lords to at least four Tory MPs, including the current Secretary of State for Scotland. So here's another test of judgment for the new Prime Minister. Does he think it right to keep a man in the Cabinet who is clearly far more interested in getting his hands on an ermine robe than playing by the rules of Scottish democracy? Mr Speaker, I'm obviously not going to comment on speculation around such lists. Any list would, of course, follow the normal procedures and processes that are in place. Ian Black. 
I'm, 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 I'm afraid it's uh, not speculation, and of course the Prime Minister clearly doesn't get how corrupt this all looks to people in Scotland. Because not only do we have a UK government that denies democracy, we now have a Secretary of State that is running scared from it. In the middle of a Tory cost of living crisis, the Scotland office is now to be led by a baron in waiting, yep. biding his time until he can cash in on the 300 day job for life in the House of Lords. He should be sacked from the Cabinet, and the people of Dumfries and Galloway should be given the chance to sack the Tories yeah, yeah. in a by election. The Prime Minister's judgment is already in tatters. If he has any integrity left, will he now put a stop to these two predecessors? Stuffing the House of Lords yep. with his cronies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what the Secretary of State and I are jointly focused on is working constructively with the Scottish Government to deliver for the people of Scotland. I'll be pleased to be meeting the First Minister tomorrow because that, I think, is what the people of Scotland want to see. Yeah. Indian Collins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Criminal gangs who are operating to bring people into this country in small boats, an issue that directly affects my constituents of folks in Hyde, are openly using social media platforms to recruit people to use their services. Can my right honourable friend confirm that the online safety bill will require social media platforms to take effective action to remove this content? And is it also the intention of the government to bring the bill back later this month? Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his work in raising awareness of this particular issue? He is absolutely right, and I'm pleased to give him the reassurance that the online safety bill will require platforms to remove and limit the spread of illegal content and activity online. Assisting illegal immigration is listed as a priority bill in the a priority offence in the bill, and we look forward to bringing it back to the House in due course. Samuel Roberts. The Prime Minister is struggling to rebuild the Tories' ruined economic credibility after his predecessor scorned the Office for Budget Responsibility. But in a Bloomberg interview just last week, his Trade Secretary disputed OBR forecasts that trade will be 15 per cent lower because of Brexit. Britain's economic prospects are worsened by being outside the world's largest trading bloc. That is a fact. So who does he agree with? The OBR or his Tory minister? Well, well, Mr Speaker, one of the great opportunities of Brexit is our ability to trade more with countries around the world. Actually, I know the honourable. I know the honourable lady will actually want to speak to many of the Welsh farmers who are enjoying selling their lamb to the new markets that we have opened up for them. That's what we'll get on and deliver. Millions. Mr. Speaker, excessive housing targets are placing greater and greater pressure on councils to approve development which damages our environment. Right. When the Prime Minister came to Finchley over the summer, he said he wanted to abolish those targets. Will he use the levelling up bill report stage to bring forward government amendments to do that? Uh, Mr Speaker, the government is committed to making home ownership a reality for a new generation, and we must build homes in the right places where people want to live and work. But, as the Right Honourable Lady knows, and as I said, I want those decisions to be taken locally, with greater say for local communities rather than distant bureaucrats, and my Right Honourable Friend, the Secretary of State, is happy to sit and meet with her to discuss how best to make this a reality. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister remember back in February when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer when I, I informed him that due to his incompetence in that job, the children in my constituency would go to bed that night with no food in their tummy and no heat in their homes? What is he now going to do as Prime Minister to make sure that in every community in our country, children aren't in that situation in this hard winter ahead. Well, Mr Speaker, the absolute best way to ensure that children do not grow up in poverty, which is something that none of us want to see, is to ensure that they do not grow up in a workless household. And the record under these governments is that 700,000 fewer children are growing up in workless households, and that's because Conservative governments create jobs for people, Mr Speaker, and that's the best anti-poverty strategy that we have. On Friday, I visited a bridging hotel in my constituency (coughs) that is currently housing 77 Afghan refugees. As local organisations search for permanent accommodation for them following the success of Operation Pitting. 
Many of the refugees I met held highly skilled jobs back in Afghanistan, including a doctor, international athletes and government ministers. Can the Prime Minister assure the House that our government will do more to support these highly skilled individuals to enter the UK workforce? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not nice to hear from my honourable friend uh, again this week, and I can reassure him that we are completely committed to supporting Afghan refugees into the employment opportunities here in the UK. The Department for Work and Pensions uh, has a full programme in place, and I can also tell him that our Refugee Leads Network brings together refugee organisations and DWP to connect those refugees with employment opportunities, and I look forward to seeing the fruits of that programme with him in the near future. Bradshaw. Five years ago, the government belatedly launched a review into the security risk posed by handing thousands of mainly wealthy Russian and Chinese nationals so-called golden visas so they could live in Britain. It also promised to publish the results of that review. Why hasn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Speaker, we did indeed review and indeed end the, the visa that the honourable gentleman is raising. Uh, the Home Office is currently conducting the right way to replace that visa with something that is more sustainable going forward and protects our security interests. I'll be happy to have the Home Secretary write to him with an update on that process. Siobhan Burley. Thank you, Mr. a workforce shortage, yet millions of parents are unable to work at full tilt and childcare providers are going belly up due to policies being a maddenly expensive muddle of a mess. Will my right honourable friend please confirm that after decades of ineffective tinkering and endless policies that he will be the man to give us proper childcare reform? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to say we've announced ambitious new plans to improve the cost, the choice and the availability of childcare to benefit hundreds of thousands of parents across the country. This includes measures to increase the number of children that we can look after by each staff member and indeed make it easier for people to become childminders. We'll respond to all of these proposals in very short order. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I know the Prime Minister has been very busy failing to stand up to bullies, but in the real world, in the real world schools and colleges across the country looking after actual children are struggling to make ends meet. One London head teacher has scrapped plans for mental health counsellors. A head teacher in Twickenham is no longer filling teaching assistant vacancies, whilst another is axing school trips. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister give pupils and parents a cast iron guarantee that in next week's autumn statement there will be no real terms cuts to school and college budgets? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we've significantly increased funding going into schools over the next two years, but on top of that, it was important to this government to help those children who left behind their education opportunities during the pandemic, which is why we invested £5 billion to helping those children catch up, including unveiling the most, embraced, most comprehensive programme of tutoring that this country has ever seen. It is closing the attainment gap and disproportionately benefiting disadvantaged children, and it's something that I know all colleagues will get behind. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Despite a productive meeting with the Immigration Minister yesterday, the Home Office continues to house over 400 asylum seekers in two neighbouring hotels in my constituency. It is clear from my meetings with GPs and Derbyshire Police that this huge influx of people in such a small area is putting local services under immense strain. Before services in Area Wash hit breaking point, will my right honourable friend commit to immediate reduction in, in asylum seekers concentrated in one uh, place? And will he intervene to set a timetable for permanent closure of accommodation centres at this location? Well, Mr. Speaker, let me give my honourable friend my absolute. Uh, cast iron commitment that we want to get to grips with this problem. The best way to resolve it is to stop criminal gangs profiting from an illegal trade in human lives and the unacceptable rise in channel crossings, which is putting unsustainable pressure on our system and local services. She has my reassurance that the Home Secretary and I are working day and night to resolve this problem, not just to end the use of expensive contingency accommodation, but for more fundamental reform so that we can finally get to grips with this issue, protect our borders and end illegal migration. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
<coughs> Mr Speaker, under the Prime Minister's short premiership, he's had one minister resign and one that urgently needs to be sacked. Mm. Can the Prime Minister clarify to the House and the rest of the country when the scheduled programme of integrity, professionalism and accountability will begin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, it's precisely because I want a government characterised by integrity, professionalism and accountability that the right honourable gentleman was right to resign and it's right that we have an independent process. That's the type of government I will lead. When situations like this arise, we will deal with them properly and that's what we have done. Ian Russell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, How is it? It's quite amazing isn't it, when a minister's come from his post to get more cheers. Come on, Dean Ross. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleagues. Um, just, just like the Prime Minister, I was very fortunate to join the Royal British Legion in becoming a poppy volunteer recently. Uh, I joined uh, uh, colleagues in, uh, in Abbots Langley, and I was part of Les Bettersy's team. And this week, I'll be joining Tony Griffiths and his team in the Tudor Ward in Watford. Mr. Speaker. I would like to ask if the Prime Minister will join me in thanking all of the Poppy Appeal volunteers yeah. across the country yeah. and in my constituency yeah. for their work to ensure that we always remember those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. And if the Prime Minister or perhaps the Minister for Veterans will also visit Watford to meet our heroic veterans who we owe so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. My honourable friend is a fantastic champion for Watford and it is a pleasure yeah. 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 to join him in thanking the Royal British Legion's Poppy Appeal volunteers, both in Watford and across the country. Uh, there is no greater sacrifice than those who lay down their lives in the service of our nation. So I am proud, as many others are, to support the Poppy Appeal and to honour our veterans. Carl Turner. If the Prime Minister or any member of his many households became unwell, would he start ringing the GP surgery at 8 o'clock each morning to not get an appointment? Would he go off to accident and emergency and wait 12 hours to be seen? Would he call an ambulance which wouldn't come? Or would he use some of his £750 million pounds unearned wealth to pay privately and see somebody there and then? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I am very grateful, and let me put on record my thanks to the fantastic team at the Friar Ridge Hospital in North Allerton, who have provided excellent care to my family over the years. Uh, but the Honourable Gentleman is right to highlight the issue of people waiting unacceptably long for treatment that they need. That's why we've put record funding into the NHS to help with backlogs and waiting times this winter. It's why the Health Secretary and the Chancellor are discussing how best to deliver the reforms that we need, because I want to make sure that everyone gets the care they need, and we will continue to invest in more doctors, more nurses and more community scans so that we can deliver exactly that. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Blackpool is due to benefit from a £300 million private sector-led regeneration project which will deliver thousands of new jobs for my constituents yeah, yeah, yeah. over the years ahead. To deliver this ambitious new project, we need support with a £40 million package of relocating the existing court complex which currently occupies the site. Various Secretaries of State have been very supportive of the project so far, so is the Prime Minister able to give me an update on when we can receive some good news about how we can get this project off the ground? Yeah. Well, I, can, I, can I join with the Honourable Member in recognising the importance of the Blackpool Central Regeneration Project to the town's levelling up ambitions? I, I can tell him that my uh, right honourable friend, the Justice Secretary and uh, Housing Secretary, are in the process of resolving this issue for him and how best we can relocate the court complex. And I can tell him he won't have to wait very long for an update on the plans. Speaker, it is a critical time for our steel industry, hit by massive energy costs and low demand at a time when we need to support our industry to adapt to, be, to build the green technologies that we will need. Does the Prime Minister agree that our sovereign capability and our national security is dependent on a strong UK steel industry? And if so, will the Government not sit on its hands? And what is the Prime Minister's plan for steel? Yeah. Oh, uh, M M Mr Speaker, I'm proud of our track record. Not only do we support one steel company in South Wales 
during coronavirus that needed our assistance, which we were uh, pleased to do. We also have provided over £2 billion to support energy intensive industries, including steel with high energy bills, and thanks to the work of uh, my colleagues, removed the tariffs and exporting steel to the United States. But she has my assurance that we will continue to support steel because we recognise its importance to our economy and to our communities up and down the country. Chris Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supermarkets such as Morrison's are abusing their dominant market position on fuel, charging up to 20p per litre more in Bridport than other towns in the region, thus preventing West Dorset residents from benefiting from the very unusual reduction in market price these days. Will the Prime Minister agree to meet with me to discuss what action can be taken against these commercial predators who harm our local residents in this way. Well, M- Mr Speaker, as Chancellor, I was pleased to cut duty by 5p a litre, the biggest ever cut in fuel duty to help motorists in our country. Uh, but I recognise the concerns the Honourable Gentleman raised. That's why we asked the Competition and Markets Authority to conduct an urgent review of the market. Uh, there are some actions to be considered coming out of that review, and I look forward to meeting with him and working with the CMA to explore its recommendations in more detail. Liam Byrne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tomorrow, across my constituency of Hodge Hill, I'll be delivering food bank collection crates because once more our food banks are running out of food. Does the Prime Minister understand the despair my constituents feel that he, as one of the richest men in Britain, is doing so little? They don't like the truth, Mr Speaker. Does he understand the despair my constituents feel that he is doing so little for the poorest in Britain by refusing to cancel the £3 billion tax break for non-DOMs who profit from our country but won't make our country their home? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm proud of my and this government's track record in supporting the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, and that will always continue. And it is a bit rich hearing from the gentleman, who, the first person who reminded us what happens when the economy gets crashed by a Labour government. That's no way to help people. We will build a strong economy. That's what enables us to support the most vulnerable. That's what enables us to support strong public services. Uh, the British people are reliant on our party and this government to fulfil its promises on levelling and up, uh, up. Yeah. not just up and down the country, but <coughs> sideways too. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the Felixstowe and Harwich Freeport plan will be judged as an historic failure unless such a plan succeeds in levelling up a deprived ward that is in my constituency? And will my right honourable friend join me in Clacton to kickstart that plan? Also. Mr Speaker, will my right honourable friend commit to coming to the tendering showcase currently in the Jubilee Room until 2.30 this evening? That sounds like a very appealing invitation, Mr Speaker, but I agree with my honourable friend that levelling up has to deliver for communities in every corner of the United Kingdom, including in coastal communities in the south, Mr Speaker. He knows I'm a champion of free ports, and I look forward to working with him to see how best we can realise their benefits in his area. That completes Prime Minister's questions. Those who wish to leave, please do so quietly. statement prime minister Mr speaker i'd like to make a statement on cop 27 prime minister points of orders come after the statements sorry prime minister sorry what's he saying it can't relate to the pnq so he didn't ask a question We'll deal with it afterwards. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, With permission, I'd like to make a statement on COP27, which I attended in Sharm el-Sheikh on Monday. When the United Kingdom took on the UK presidency of COP, just one-third of the global economy was committed to net zero. Today, that figure is 90 per cent. And the reduction in global emissions pledged during our presidency is now equivalent to the entire annual emissions of America. 
Now, there is still a long way to go to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees, but the historic Glasgow Climate Pact kept that goal within reach. And the whole House, I know, will want to join me in paying tribute to my right honourable friend, the member for Reading West, for his inspirational leadership as COP president. The question at this summit, Mr Speaker, was whether countries would deliver on their promises. I'm pleased to say that our nation will. We have already cut our carbon emissions faster than anyone else in the G7, and we will fulfil our ambitious commitment to reduce emissions by at least 68 per cent by the end of the decade. Now, I know that some have feared Putin's abhorrent war in Ukraine could distract from global efforts to tackle climate change, but I believe it should catalyse them. Climate security and energy security go hand in hand. Putin's contemptible manipulation of energy prices has only reinforced the importance of ending our dependence on fossil fuels. So we will make this country a clean energy superpower. We will accelerate our transition to renewables, which have already grown fourfold as a proportion of electricity supply over the last decade. We will invest in building new nuclear power stations for the first time since the 1990s. And by committing £30 billion to support our green industrial revolution, we will leverage up to £100 billion of private investment to support almost half a million high-wage, high-skilled green jobs. Mr Speaker, there is also no solution to climate change without protecting and restoring nature. So at COP27, the UK committed to £90 million to the Congo Basin. As part of £1.5 billion, we are investing in protecting the world's forests. And I co-hosted the first meeting of our Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership, which will deliver on the historic commitment to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030. Now, central to all our efforts is keeping our promises on climate finance. So the UK is delivering on our commitment of £11.6 billion. And to support the most vulnerable who are experiencing the worst impacts of climate change, we will triple our funding on adaptation to reach £1.5 billion a year in 2025. In Glasgow, the UK pioneered a new global approach, using aid funding to unlock billions of pounds of private finance for new green infrastructure. So I was delighted to join President Ramaphosa to mark the publication of his investment plan, which delivers on this new model. South Africa will benefit from cheaper, cleaner power, cutting emissions, while simultaneously creating new green jobs for his people. And we will look to support other international partners in taking a similar approach. We also made further commitments to support clean power in developing countries. This included investing a further £65 million in commercialising innovative clean technologies and working with the private sector to deliver a raft of, raft of green investment projects in Kenya. Now, Mr Speaker, the summit also allowed me to meet many of my counterparts for the first time. With, Egyptian president, with the Egyptian president, I raised the case of the British Egyptian citizen, Allah Abdel Fattah, and I know the whole House will share my deep concern about his case, which grows more urgent by the day. And we will continue to press the Egyptian government to resolve this situation. We want to see Allah freed and reunited with his family as soon as possible. With President Macron, we discussed our shared determination to crack down on criminal smuggling gangs. And I also discussed illegal migration with other European leaders too. We are all facing the same shared challenge, and we agreed to solve it together. And finally, I had good meetings with the new Prime Minister of Italy, the German Chancellor, the President of the EU, the President of Israel, and the leaders of UAE, Kenya and Norway, as well as the UN Secretary General. In all of these discussions, the United Kingdom is acting with our friends to stand up for our values around the world, to deliver stability and security at home. Tackling climate change and securing our energy independence is central to these objectives. So even though we may now have handed over the presidency of COP, the United Kingdom will proudly 
continue to lead the global effort to deliver net zero. Because this is the way to ensure the security and prosperity of our country for today and generations to come. And I commend this statement yeah, yeah, to the yeah. House. Yeah. Call the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for advance copy of his statement? Uh, and can I start by raising the case of Ala Abdul Fattah? Yes. Um, as the Prime Minister knows and has said, he is a British citizen jailed for the crime of posting on social media and been imprisoned in Egypt for most of the last nine years. Yeah. He's been on hunger strike for the last six months. Now, the Prime Minister just said that he raised it with President Sisi. Can he tell us what progress he made in securing Allah's release? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, it's right that the Prime Minister eventually went to COP27. Yeah. Remember the stakes. The world is heading for 2.8 degrees of warming. That's mass flooding, habitats destroyed, untold damage to lives and livelihoods. We must prevent that for security, for the public finances and for the next generation. And that's why it was inexplicable that he had to be dragged kicking and screaming to even get on the plane. Britain should be leading on the world stage, helping the world confront the greatest challenge of our time. But his snub, one of the first decisions of his premiership, was a terrible error of judgment and sent a clear message that if you're looking for leadership from this Prime Minister, look elsewhere. That if you want to get this Prime Minister to go somewhere, get the right honourable member for Uxbridge first, get him to come along, then the Prime Minister will follow. And his reluctance is so bizarre because climate change is not just a once-in-a-generation responsibility, it's also a once-in-a-generation opportunity an opportunity to lower energy bills for good, an opportunity to ensure Britain's security is never again at the mercy of tyrants like Putin, an opportunity to create millions of jobs and break out of the Tory cycle of low growth and high taxes, opportunities he's passing by. The Prime Minister said in his speech at COP27 that we need to act faster on renewables. So why is he the roadblock at home? As he was flying to Egypt, his minister was reaffirming the ban on onshore wind, the cheapest, cleanest form of power that we have. The Prime Minister also said at COP27 that he realises the importance of ending our dependence on fossil fuels. But he's inserted a massive oil and gas giveaway when Labour forced him into a windfall tax. Taxpayers' cash handed over for digging up fossil fuels. Yeah. Shell have made £26 billion in profits so far this year, but not a penny paid on windfall taxes. He's completely let them off the hook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what about the industries of the future? Manufacturers of batteries for cars in Britain struggling. Green hydrogen producers struggling. Yet in other countries, these industries are taking off. Jobs going abroad because we've got no industrial strategy here at home. And as he said at COP27, it was right to honour our promises to developing countries. Why is he cutting the aid budget? It's always the same message, do as I say, not as I do. And because of that, it will always fall on deaf ears. Mr Speaker, it's time for a fresh start. A Labour government would make Britain the first major economy to reach 100% clean power by 2030. Yeah. That would cut bills, strengthen our energy security, create jobs and make Britain a clean energy superpower. Yeah. And our Green Prosperity Plan would establish GB Energy, a publicly owned energy company, yeah. to invest in the technologies and the jobs of the future here in the UK. As we attempt this endeavour, we have a fair wind at our back, not just the ingenuity, the brilliance of people and businesses in this country, but the natural resources of our island nation. Wealth lies in our seas and in our skies, and it's an act of national self-harm not to prioritise them over expensive gas. That is the choice at the next general election. Whenever it comes, more of the same with the Tories or a fairer, greener future exactly. with Labour. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, you know, the, the honourable gentleman raised the matter of my attendance at COP. I just would gently point out to him that Labour prime ministers failed to attend, I think, 
12 of the 13 COPs held during their time in office. Uh, as, as, Chancellor, as Chancellor, I hosted the Finance Day on COP last year, where we had landmark agreements to rewire the financial system to unlock the trillions of dollars we need in private finance to flow to help us with the transition. It is a record I am proud of, and it is a record, by the way, that is recognised internationally around the world. To just deal with his brief substantive questions, he asked about renewable power. Well, Mr. Speaker, 40 per cent of our electricity now comes from renewable power. That is up fourfold since 2010. And this, what do we inherit? A Labour government that believed there was no economic case for new nuclear power, Mr. Speaker. He talked about oil and gas. We talk, he talked about oil and gas. Uh, again, it, he needs to live in the real world, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it, Oil and gas are going to be a part of our energy mix in the transition for the several years ahead, and it's simply pie in the sky to pretend otherwise. The Independent Committee on Climate Change has even recognised that, and the carbon footprint of having homegrown gas is half the footprint of importing it from abroad, so it is a sensible thing to do. But look, Mr Speaker, our, our plan is the right plan. It's realistic, it's credible, it's delivering for the British people as well as delivering on our climate adjustments. Uh, his, his own, I think his own Shadow Chief Secretary described his climate plan as quote unquote a borrowing plan. And we know where that leads us, Mr Speaker. It's not the right thing for the British people. Well, m m Mr Speaker, I know the British people trust me to manage the economy. They won't trust the Labour Party. Uh, uh, he, 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 he might be focused. He might be focused. In reparations around the world, we're focused on creating a strong economy here at home, and that's what we'll do. Theresa May. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome my right honourable friend's statement and also welcome the continued commitment that he and the government are showing to net zero by 2050 to tackling climate change. He is absolutely right to talk about the creation of high-skilled, high-wage, green jobs as we green our economy. But people need to have the training and the skills and education to be able to take on those jobs. What are the government's plans in relation to education and training for green skills? My uh, right honourable friend is, is absolutely right, and I thank her for her warm comments. Uh, I point her to our, our record investment in apprenticeships in particular, but also to the new lifelong learning entitlement, which acknowledges that people will have to retrain at, at any point during their life to take advantage of the new op economic opportunities that are coming our way, and I'm pleased that we'll be rolling out that programme over the coming years. Three minutes. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Prime Minister for advance sight of his statement? And let me also welcome the Prime Minister's last-minute change of heart to actually attend COP27. But I'm afraid, whether he likes it or not, his initial instinct telling him not to attend will be long remembered and rightly remembered. Yeah. It means he now has a major job in convincing people that he is truly committed to the challenge of climate change. And, of course, that commitment starts with our own domestic targets. But it is vital that our collective commitment also extends to those in the Global South. Nations and peoples are being damaged the most by a climate crisis that they have contributed the least to. These are the poorest people on this planet, and they always seem to be paying the highest price. That is why it is so right and so necessary that loss and damage was on the formal COP agenda for the very first time. I am proud to say that through the leadership of our First Minister, Scotland has become the first developed nation to pledge finance address loss and damage. And our country is now committed to a total of £7 million, pounds, a small sum in the scale of what is needed, but a powerful message to larger nations who need to follow that lead. Because we don't need to wait for consensus and a decision at COP. We can start funding loss and damage programmes straight away. So can I ask the Prime Minister if he will guarantee that UK overseas aid earmarked for climate finance will be spent within the five-year time frame as originally promised? And can he also guarantee that the total aid budget won't be slashed further in the autumn statement next week? And finally, in terms of the new Prime Minister's domestic targets on climate, will he honour the promises made to the North East of Scotland in carbon capture and storage? Will he commit to taking the Scottish cluster off the government's reserve list and fund it right now? 
Well, Mr Speaker, I'm actually pleased that it was the UK that established a new Glasgow dialogue on loss and damage to discuss arrangements for funding activities to avert, minimise and address loss and damage, and those conversations are ongoing. Uh, with regard to our international climate finance pledges, as I said, we remain committed to the £11.6 billion. It is our intention to deliver it over the time frame uh, that was originally envisaged. And with regard to targets, again, it should be a source of enormous pride for everyone in this House that we have decarbonised in this country faster than any other G7 country. Uh, and our targets are among the most ambitious in the world, and we have a credible plan to get on and deliver them. Philip Dunn. Speaker, can I congratulate my right honourable friend for his crystal clear commitment, both in Sharm el Sheikh and in this chamber here today, to delivering net zero Britain? There is no doubt about that under his prime ministership. Yeah. Now we no longer uh, have the presidency of COP, uh, which has been acting as a forcing mechanism across co government. How, can he clarify how he intends that his government uh, will deliver our ambitious? nationally determined contribution to reduce emissions um, across the disparate strands of government, uh, government departments. Well, my uh, my honourable friend makes an excellent point, and I can assure him that though we, though we are no longer formally presidents of COP, our leadership on this issue internationally uh, will not waver, and he has my commitment on that. And and I personally will drive this through government in conjunction with the Secretary of State for Business and Energy, indeed, and with our Climate Change Minister. But this is something, Mr. Speaker, that pervades all aspects of government now, and that's why we have to change our thinking on this. It's not the work of any one department or any one minister. If we're going to make this commitment work, we're going to all all have to play our part. John Trickett. Thank you very much. And given the scale of what's about to happen to our planet, every single one of us must do what we can to alleviate the problems which we're facing. But one percent, the one percent richest people on our planet are responsible for the same amount of global emissions as the poorest 50 percent. Does the Prime Minister accept that unless we tackle the issues of social justice, we will not resolve? the problems of climate change and was he comfortable that one of the worst polluters in the planet coca-cola sponsored the recent meeting of cop yeah. Yeah. Well, mr speaker as we've been discussing i believe we do have a moral obligation to help those countries with the transition to net zero and i'm proud to say that we are playing our part in doing that and it was great at cop to sit down with leaders from many of those emerging market countries that are benefiting from the investments from our country to help them with the transition and they recognize the leadership role that we are playing Rick Clark. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. We need to create jobs and prosperity as we transition to net zero. Uh, and in battery technology, we're world leading in the research, but we need to manufacture batteries here. Now, given the concerning news about British Volt, will the Prime Minister and his colleagues commission an urgent review of how we can deliver the gigafactories that are necessary in this country in the short term to make sure that we have a continuing, vibrant car manufacturing industry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I thank my honourable friend, and I'm, I'm pleased to say I think it may have been his idea that we created the Faraday Battery Challenge, but it was pleased that it was, I was pleased to support that as Chancellor with £200 million of funding. He's right about the importance of building a domestic gigafactory capability. I was pleased with the announcement from Envision and Nissan in Sunderland. Uh, there's more in the pipeline, and we have the Automotive Transformation Fund available to support those projects to build the vibrant ecosystem that he and I both want to see. Ed Davey. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I welcome what the Prime Minister said at COP, that tackling climate change goes hand in hand with lowering energy bills, improving our energy security and hurting Putin in his illegal war in Ukraine. However, I am alarmed that at home the Prime Minister has banned onshore wind, one of the cheapest and most popular forms of renewable energy. So will the Prime Minister confirm whether his priority is cutting people's energy bills, improving Britain's energy security and tackling global climate change, or keeping the dinosaurs on his back benches happy, why won't he, why won't he get rid of the ban on onshore wind? 
Mr Speaker, it started so well. Um, <laughs> No, we, we are committed to reducing people's bills and to having more forms of renewable energy, and our track record on this is superb. Four times more than in 2010 the amount of renewable energy. Zero carbon energy now accounts uh, for all, uh, half of our electricity needs, and we are poised to do more. Offshore wind is a thing we are focusing on, along with nuclear, and we are now a world leader in offshore wind, and it's providing cheap forms of electricity and energy for households up and down the country, and alongside nuclear, that's how we'll transition to a cleaner grid. Chris Grayling. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank my uh, right honourable friends for getting our environmental strategies back on track? We clearly have a major issue, not simply around carbon, but also about the loss of biodiversity, both on land and at sea. And I welcome what he says about our support for the Congo Basin. We have, in a month's time, another crucial summit in Montreal, the CBD summit, where further decisions will be taken about how we tackle the loss of biodiversity internationally. Can I ask him to ensure that the United Kingdom plays the fullest possible part in those discussions and a leadership role in tackling this issue going forward? Uh, you know, my honourable friend is, is absolutely right, and there were very many moving uh, statements from leaders across the globe at COP on this particular topic, and it's something that we are, I can confirm to him, we are widely acknowledged around the world to be a leader on for putting this on the agenda last year in Glasgow. Uh, the Secretary of State for the Environment will be attending that, that COP in Montreal, and also our World Leading Environment Act commits us to reducing the decline in biodiversity, biodiversity and species loss, and I look forward to working with him to deliver on it. Sarah Champion. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, Prime Minister, of course, I welcome any investment to the Global South to mitigate against the horrific damages of global ch uh, climate change. But is this new money? Mm. Is it coming out of the existing mm. ODA budget? What's being cut if it is coming out of the existing ODA budget? Exactly. And also, as Chancellor, you made savage cuts to climate mitigation programmes. Are you going to be pro replacing those? Uh, Mr Speaker, as Chancellor, yes, I did make difficult decisions to ensure that our public finances were on a sustainable trajectory. That's not something that I'm going to shy away from, because I think we've all seen what happens when the government doesn't command the confidence of the international markets when it comes to borrowing and debt issues. And I thought in that context it was reasonable to temporarily reduce our ODA budget until our public finances are in a better place, and that is a commitment that I stand by. But within, we are remaining committed to the £11.6 billion in international climate finance that we committed at the time, uh, and those announcements have come from that budget, and it's very welcome that we're able to continue delivering that, even though we are facing some other difficult decisions on uh, to other topics. Yeah. Theresa Villiers. Uh, the Prime Minister has, has emphasised the very substantial investment being made in climate-related measures, both at home and overseas. But will he share with me reservations about the idea of spending trillions more pounds on so-called reparations payments, right. as advocated by the opposition, yeah, yeah, at a time right, right. when the public finances are already ever, right, right. Ever. quite right? My right honourable friend is, is absolutely right. That is not the right approach, and it's worrying to hear the uh, members of the party opposite suggesting that it is. What we are doing is fulfilling our obligations to help those emerging markets transition to a cleaner future, and we're doing that in a way that supports them, but also supports British companies who are able to provide those investments and create jobs here at home as well. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker. I'm grateful for my continued rent-free tenancy in the Prime Minister's head, but if in future he could just let me know when he intends to speak about me, that would be helpful. That's the norm in the House. But could I ask him if he would take this opportunity to welcome the election of President Lula in Brazil and his commitment to both social justice and environmental justice? and confirm what the previous Prime Minister told this House, that no British bank or financial institution or company will henceforth be allowed to invest in fossil fuel extraction anywhere in the world as part of our contribution to bringing about net zero globally. 
Uh, well, I, th I thank the uh, honourable, honourable gentleman for his question. If he could ask the leader of the opposition maybe to give me advance sight of his questions, I'd be happy to then let him know <laughs> if, I, uh, if I need to bring him up on questions of security. Uh, but look, I, I agree with him on the importance. I agree with him on the importance of ending international finance for coal-fired power plants. It was a landmark agreement that the COP president and the UK presidency achieved at COP. Uh, Ninety other countries have signed up to it at a minimum, and it's key, I'm keen to make sure that we deliver on those commitments and we push them through the international financial system. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My Essex constituents absolutely get the impact of climate change because they saw it firsthand in those awful fires last summer. Many of them also get that unless we help other countries to mitigate and adapt to climate change, we will see even more unsustainable migration and that will impact us at home. So it's great that uh, my right honourable friend has reconfirmed our commitment to the investment amounts that we promised in, in Glasgow, that he has reconfirmed our commitment to deliver those on time, and can he confirm that we will continue to work with other countries to make sure those investments are made on time? Yeah. Can, I, can I thank my honourable friend for all her work in this area? It's an area that she's rightly passionate about and has made an enormous difference in, and I look forward to receiving her continued advice on how we can deliver on our commitments. Uh, I'm pleased to give her that reassurance. And actually, our doubling of our international climate finance commitment was a catalyst for many other countries around the world, as she knows, doing the same. Uh, and we want to now make sure that all that money is spent and spent well, and that's what we'll do. Uh, Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister just said how important it is to keep our promises on climate finance, and I agree with him. Can he explain why he doesn't seem to agree with himself, since his government hasn't kept its climate promises? He's not delivered the $300 million that we still owe to the Green Climate and Adaptation Funds. When are we going to see that? Will he ensure that all new climate finance is new and additional, not being raided from an ever-diminishing aid budget? And finally, does he recognise that the moral obligation that he talks about must now extend beyond mitigation and adaptation to address loss and damage? And specifically, will he support the establishment of a finance facility for loss and damage at COP27? Well, Mr Speaker, I've, I've already made the point on loss and damage that we established the Glasgow Dialogue to see how best to take forward those discussions. I'm not going to preempt the discussions that are happening uh, at COP, uh, but I would make the point that this is not the same as reparations. I think the Honourable Lady uh, understands that, but that is not what is on the table, and that is clear in the language that's being debated at COP. Well, at COP26, the Prime Minister was very successful in mobilising hundreds of billions of international private capital uh, to support uh, the challenge of, of net zero, which seems to me a much better deal than Labour's plan, which will place a huge burden on British taxpayers. Yeah. So can my right hon. Friend tell me what further steps he will do to consolidate London's leadership as a centre for green finance? Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this is something that my hon. Friend knows well, and, and indeed he was responsible for the retail green sovereign bond that we issued here, first in the, country, uh, first in the world to do so. He deserves credit for that. Uh, but I'm pleased that London has now, I think, for the second or third year in a row, been named the world's leading place for green finance. There's a range of initiatives that we're taking forward around disclosures uh, to make that even more of an advantage for us in including more carbon trading, and I look forward to getting his advice on how we can make that aspiration a reality. Near Griffith. Speaker. Well, the Welsh Labour Government is setting up a publicly owned company to accelerate investment in onshore wind and other renewables, thus reducing emissions, increasing energy security and using profit for the public good. So, given that onshore wind is the cheapest form of renewable energy, when will the Prime Minister now step up to the mark, match the Welsh Government and bring forward an accelerated investment programme of onshore wind across England? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, well, this, Mr Speaker, I think there's been a slightly chequered uh, history of Labour councils doing uh, publicly owned energy companies from memory in, in Nottingham. It's not a model that I think we want to emulate. But what I can tell her, we are supporting Wales with the transition. We've invested in the Hollyhead Hydrogen Hub, which is a potential opportunity in the future. We're looking at nuclear sites and, indeed, as we heard earlier uh, from our honourable friend, the huge potential of floating offshore wind uh, in the Celtic Sea, which will also all be good for Wales. Steve Ryan. It's so obvious that we have a Prime Minister who is so personally committed to this agenda, and my constituents really appreciate that, as does their MP. The Prime Minister knows how important the Solent Freeport 
in his old neck of the woods could be to my constituents yeah, yeah. and much further afield. So will he and his government work with us, not least given that part of the Solent Freeport is based at and around Southampton Airport, on sustainable aviation fuels, which is an area this country has a really good lead in already yeah. and could be really to our advantage as well as lead to a whole new future of clean air travel? Yeah. I thank my uh, honourable friend for his, his kind comments. Uh, he's right about the potential for the Freeport, which I'm uh, pleased to champion, uh, not least as a Southampton boy, but also about the opportunity for sustainable aviation fuel, where it is clear, actually, in conversations with industry, that we are in a position of world leadership on this issue. I was pleased to invest about £200 million to help commercialise two sustainable aviation fuel plants. But what I'm encouraged by is that the private sector is actually taking that, investing far more to bring this to reality, and that's an exciting development for the UK. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister has a, a challenge about getting money out of the door. The Bio Yorkshire project, which will bring transformation, the biggest Green New Deal before this government, needs the funding. But the funding has been committed, but just not released two years down the line. So when is he going to bring that f funding forward so we can bring the transition we need to the technologies of the future to address climate change? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I agree with the Honourable Lady that we need to invest in innovation and that's why we have a billion pound net zero innovation portfolio because ultimately it will be the technologies of the future that help us solve this problem. I'd be very happy if she writes to me to look into the specific uh, bid that she's got in. Ms Elwood. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome the Prime Minister's attendance at COP27 and our commitment to climate change. This is the biggest long term strategic challenge that the globe faces as we test the limits of our fragile planet. But net zero is a long way off. These problems we face today, extreme weather patterns, including floods, increased crop failures, the scale of which will further erode global uh, insecurity, with vulnerable states subject to desertization, food shortages and rising sea levels. Will the Prime Minister recognise that the burden in meeting some of these challenges will actually fall on our armed forces, both domestically and internationally? And could I ask him that, therefore, this is not the time to cut the defence or international aid budgets? Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, my uh, honourable friend is right about the devastation that climate change is causing, not least just look at what's happening in Pakistan, 30 million people impacted uh, with disease rife through the water, an area the size of the entire United Kingdom uh, now underwater. So he's right to highlight the issue. Uh, look, uh, he knows that I remain committed to supporting our armed forces, uh, and that will always continue to be the case. Shiamora. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister gives oil companies, nine, oh, who are already making billions in excess mm. profits, 90 pence in tax breaks for every pound they invest in oil and gas, literally fueling the climate change which is going to bring more yeah. flooding to the northeast, destroying our agriculture, lives and livelihoods, prospects and prosperity. And yet he refuses to invest in the North East to combat climate change, in our transport infrastructure, in our industry, in our green technologies and our people and skills. Why does he treat the oil companies with such largesse and leave the North East with nothing? Yeah. 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 The Honourable Lady yeah. is simply not right about this. Yeah. Uh, it, it, is, it is just not realistic or practical to think that we do not need to use oil and gas for the foreseeable future as a transition fuel. So the choice then for Honourable Members opposite is, would you rather have that from here at home or would you rather import it at almost double the carbon footprint? Yeah. So that seems to me relatively straightforward that we should be supporting domestic oil and gas production in the short term. And then she talks about uh, new investments in renewable energy in the North East as if it's not happening. She might want to come and visit Teesside, uh, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, but well, whether it's offshore wind or hydrogen or indeed carbon capture and storage, that's where the future is and it is happening in the North East. Yeah. Uh, Raymond Shushdi. Deputy Speaker, we've all seen the impact of Russia's illegal invasion on Ukraine with regards to energy and food security. Will the Prime Minister join me in addressing the false narrative by, the Russian, uh, by Russia with regards to the impact of the United Kingdom sanctions. I was the United Kingdom's Minister for Sanctions, and it is absolutely crucial we address this false narrative. The United Kingdom's sanctions against Russia do not target exports of food supplies for developing countries. That is squarely the responsibility of Putin and his administration. My honourable friend makes an 
excellent point, and it was uh, very disappointing to see Russia remove themselves from the Black Sea grain deal. Uh, I'm pleased that there is now forward progress on that, because as my honourable friend knows, almost two-thirds of the wheat that passes through uh, the Black Sea is destined for developing countries and emerging markets. So it's absolutely vital that that food flows, and we will do everything we can to put pressure on Russia to make sure that it continues to happen. Ms Savile Roberts. In 27, the Prime Minister boasted about the UK's investment in renewables. Yet a recent report by Welsh Affairs Select Committee warned that Wales's renewable energy potential is threatened by a lack of UK government leadership on improving grid continuity. Now, the Prime Minister mentioned a number of worthwhile, good projects that are in the pipeline in Wales. But without that connectivity, many of those projects are actually under threat. So will he set out an accelerated timetable for improving grid capacity so Wales can realise our full potential in energy generation and in so doing also slash bills for communities throughout? The the Honourable Lady is right that we do need to make sure we invest in our grid to enable the transition. That's an absolutely fair point. I know it's something the National Grid are focused on, and I'd be happy to get more into it and discuss it with her in the future. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, The UK is proof that you can achieve growth and slash emissions at the same time. Uh, Does the Prime Minister agree that we have an enduring commitment to go for clean and sustainable growth? My honourable friend is absolutely right. Our record on this is 44 per cent reduction in climate emissions, 76 per cent GDP growth. It shows it's possible, Mr Deputy Speaker, and that's what Britain is delivering. And Bradshaw? What exactly is his problem with onshore wind? Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's right that we bring people with us as we transition to net zero. The worst thing we can do is alienate communities if we want to actually deliver on our climate commitments. And as it turns out, we are very lucky to have a very reliable, very affordable form of energy in offshore wind, which is also creating jobs domestically in the UK, and it's right that that is our priority. And Fletcher. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. After two wonderful weeks last November in, in, in Glasgow and uh, with the Honourable Member opposite, what became really clear was actually how far ahead industry and businesses uh, had of governments in terms of addressing these issues and challenges. So, for example, with electric vehicles, range anxiety is an issue for those of us that live in the northwest of England and have to try to get to London. How can I have his commitment that we are going to do everything to get government out of the way of private industry, for example, in EV charging rollout? My uh, my honourable friend makes an excellent point. Uh, We will not solve this problem without the investment and cooperation of the private sector. Governments simply can't do it alone. Uh, When it comes to electric charging infrastructure, we've helped with seed funding around £2 billion. We have one of the most developed charging infrastructures in Europe, but she's right. Ultimately, it has to be the private sector that delivers the investment that's required. West. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Would the Prime Minister say what uh, view he takes of local authorities' role in the climate emergency? In 2010, there were some fantastic programmes where, had they continued to 2022, we would have a third of our homes where people, homeowners or renters, would be paying a third of their bills which they are paying now. So what view does he take of local authorities getting stuck in to retrofit, particularly the private rented sector, which is very draughty and leaky? I'm pleased, actually, that in the spending review I conducted as Chancellor, we put aside almost £5 billion to support energy efficiency, including several programmes that support local authorities to upgrade the energy efficiency of both low-income private rented tenants, but also those in the social housing sector. Those programmes are up and running, they're well-funded, and local authorities can benefit from them. David Mundell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm delighted that this uh, government sees nuclear power as part of uh, the low-carbon future and that its skills are part of the green economy. But does my right honourable friend share my disappointment that the First Minister of Scotland and her SNP Green Coalition government continue to block nuclear development in Scotland, depriving constituencies like mine of important potential jobs and perhaps it's an issue he might raise with her when he meets her tomorrow. 
Uh, well, I, it, the Honourable Gentleman is right about the importance of nuclear power. We believe it can provide around a quarter of our energy mix by 2050. It's zero carbon, it's secure and baseload source of power. That's why we've enabled more funding for advanced forms of nuclear technology like uh, AMRs and SMRs, uh, and it would be good if we could spread those benefits across the whole United Kingdom. Sammy Wilson, Speaker. In the relentless and obsessive pursuit of net zero, the government is now adopting policies which are contradictory and in some cases dangerous. We are going to import billions of pounds worth of natural gas from countries who frack that gas, and yet we are turning our back on the natural resources we have in our own country, sacrificing revenue, jobs and energy security. We are going to rely more on wind and solar power, the earth metals for which are in the hands of autocratic regimes, especially China. And we're importing wood from America to burn in a power station in uh, the United Kingdom at a cost of billions to the, uh, the electricity consumers. Whilst these policies might be welcomed by the chattering classes, does he understand the bewilderment, frustration and anger of those who struggle to pay their electricity bills and uh, are uh, worried about energy security. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I actually agree with the Honourable Gentleman about importing LNG, and that is why I, I would keen to encourage more exploitation of our domestic oil and gas resources here in the North Sea. So he and I are aligned on that. We have conducted a new North Sea uh, tra- licensing round, which is leading to about 100 new uh, licensing applications. That will increase jobs in the UK, it will increase our energy security, and that is the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, intervention and leadership of government is, of course, welcome. Uh, as is the focus on helping developing and climate change vulnerable countries. Can I ask my right honourable friend what initiatives are being considered or indeed could be considered for business to share their technologies uh, and intellectual property and so on with expertise to help those countries move forward far more quickly than we have been able to do. It is after all business that is going to lead the research and development in this field that is going to solve the global problem which we all face. Well, friend makes an excellent point, and that is the type of leadership and contribution that Britain can make to solving this problem globally, because we are fortunate to have some of the world's best researchers uh, and companies here tackling this problem. And, and on Monday, I was pleased to announce uh, about half a dozen uh, investment opportunities in Kenya, which do exactly what the Honourable Gentleman described. It is British expertise coming to a country like that to help them with their transition in areas like solar and geothermal, and that is an exciting template for the future. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Why is the Prime Minister banning onshore wind, the best renewable energy? Well, I, the, m- m- Mr. Deputy Speaker, we're providing four times as much renewable electricity today as we did in 2010. We have plans to go even further as we roll out offshore wind, which is something that is a competitive strength for the UK, and we will complement that energy mix with new nuclear, a a, a source of energy that we all recognise that we need, that the previous Labour government said there was no economic case for at all. I'm trying to get everybody in. Please start with a question and then stop. (laughs) Nikki Aiken. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for his uh, statement today on COP27 and particularly for highlighting his discussions on migration with other European leaders? Does he agree with me that if we are to, uh, to, sort, to sort the migration crisis that we've got, that we must all work together to help those developing countries with their climate change uh, challenges so that we can also deal with the migration crisis. Yeah, the, uh, my honourable friend makes a, a good point, and that's why I was pleased to discuss the migration issue with several, particularly European leaders, because we can't solve this problem alone. And as she said, it's far better to solve it at source before it arrives on our shores, and that's the approach that we're going to take. Just Brian. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister said that uh, he and his party are more trusted by the British public on the economy. Well, there is one way of testing that, isn't there? It's a general election. We'd be happy to have that. But let me ask him whether he'd like to come and visit the Rhondda to see the problems that climate change is already bringing to one of the poorer constituencies in the land in terms of flooding, um, in terms of runoff from the mountains, in terms of housing stock, which is very elderly and difficult to insulate, and a local authority which has already got a £12 million extra budget next year just to keep the lights on and um, the, the schools and, uh, and the leisure facilities running. Will you come and visit the Rhondda and try and sort out some of these problems? Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the things the Honourable Gentleman mentioned was energy efficiency. As I said, we've got billions of pounds in programmes to support local authorities to improve the energy efficiency of homes, particularly in deprived communities and those in low incomes. Those adaptations can save them hundreds of pounds on their energy bill, and I'd urge his local authority and others to engage with us to deliver them. Rory. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As we've heard today, energy security has never been more vital, and the journey to net zero is also our journey to energy sovereignty, and it will also mean lower uh, bills and more reliable, less volatile prices uh, for our domestic market. Does my right hon. Friend agree with me that Cornwall will play a vital role in this, offering lithium, floating offshore wind and deep geo geothermal energy? And Can I extend an invitation to the Prime Minister to come and visit my businesses uh, and see the work that's going on in the South West? <laughs> well, I'd, be, uh, I I'd be delighted to, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And She's absolutely right about the importance of building resilience uh, in supply chains like lithium. And I know my, uh, my colleague is focused on our critical mineral strategy that was raised earlier as well. That is right, and Cornwall can play a key part in improving our resilience and security. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We are on the highway to climate hell, with a footstool on the accelerator, says Antonio Guterres. His government is good on making plans, making promises, setting targets, but poor on delivery. Will he therefore re establish the Department for Energy and Climate Change to coordinate a whole government approach, given that delivery of net zero is fragmented? and not on track. Well, actually, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are on track to meet all the climate targets that we've set. Our track record is that we have met them all. They are the most ambitious in the world, and it is a whole government effort. Uh, effort. I can reassure her of that, and every minister in the government is committed to doing what they need to do to deliver on our ambitions. On Bailey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In expertise terms, Stroud is the greenest constituency in the greenest county of Gloucestershire, so I welcome the important challenge about what net zero means to everyday people because we are providing the solutions. Does my right honourable friend agree that government programmes like Jet Zero and expert green tech businesses like those in Stroud are going to be pivotal to the UK, meeting our targets here affordably, affordably for our constituents and helping other countries with climate challenges? Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and this is why this can be a win-win. There are already hundreds of thousands of jobs in the UK that are involved in our transition to net zero. Not only is that good for our economy, but it's that expertise that is helping other countries make the transition. And we need to make sure that all our funding, all our policies, are geared to supporting her fantastic businesses in Stroud, because that's the right thing to do for not just us, but for the world as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker. I wrote to the Prime Minister asking him to make representation to the Egyptian President about the case of my constituent Jessica Kelly's husband, Karim Emra, who is an Egyptian human rights activist who was imprisoned. We managed to campaign to get him released, but he is the subject of a travel ban and an asset freeze. Did the Prime Minister raise that case along with Allah Abdel Fattah? And secondly, does the Prime Minister think it is right that his government should divert billions of pounds of aid funding away from those who are most vulnerable uh, to climate change and other risks when he's already made the aid budget cuts. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, we're not diverting funding. We remain committed to the £11.6 billion of climate finance that we outlined last year. Uh, and I raised, in general, the topic of human rights with the President, and I'm keen to see a release for the detainees, as are other countries, and we'll continue to press on all those matters. Mr Speaker, would the Prime Minister join me in thanking Lord Goldsmith for his work at COP27 in persuading Indonesia, home to globally important forests, to play a key role in the new Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership. And when he goes to Indonesia for the G20 summit, would my right honourable friend um, perhaps discuss with President Jokowi opportunities for energy transition finance, marine energy cooperation, and starting work together on a green-tinted free trade agreement? 
Well, not only uh, will I pay tribute to the, the work of Lord Goldsmith on this particular issue, I also pay tribute to my honourable friend for his knowledge and engagement uh, in the region. He deserves praise and credit for that. Uh, and he's actually right about the exciting opportunity to do what's called a country platform, actually, with Indonesia to bring public and private finance to help Indonesia with its energy transition. And I'm hopeful we can play a big part of that. Speaker, is his refusal to approve onshore wind generation the reason why he can't commit to 100% clean energy by 2030? Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think the Labour Party's plans were called incredible and unrealistic when it comes to climate change at the last election. Our plans are practical; they are credible, and. They are the most ambitious in the developed world, so I feel very good about them, but we need to do this in a realistic way that actually brings people along with us, and that's what our targets do. Dr. Ben Spencer. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank my right honourable friend for his statement. Today, just stop oil processes have been on the M25, causing disruption and misery to my constituents, including, including causing problems of access to my local hospital. Does my right honourable friend agree with me, rather than illegal stunts that endanger lives, these protesters should look at our record of delivery on net zero, from renewables to the Glasgow Climate Pact, and work constructively with us to deliver on our, our environmental ambitions? Uh, I, I completely agree with my honourable friend, and I sympathise with his hard-working constituents who are having to deal with this kind of disruption. That's why we are moving ahead with legislation to give the police the powers they need to stop this type of extremist protesting, disrupting the lives of working people. And I very much hope the party opposite actually join us in supporting those changes. Jim Diana Johnson. Deputy Speaker, will the Prime Minister urgently press ahead with carbon capture storage in the Humber? It's the largest uh, emitter, industrial emitter of carbon. Mm -hmm. And it's not right that the British taxpayer should just pay for this. Shouldn't multinational companies that emit carbon also have a role to, to pay in financing carbon capture storage? I, I, the, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right about the importance of carbon capture and storage, which is why we have committed to investing a billion pounds to develop a couple of clusters over the next several years. She will know the announcement that have been made for the ones. and She is right also that it can't just be about what the government does. Our money is designed to catalyse the investment necessary from private companies, and that is what I hope to see happen. Stafford. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I welcome my right honourable friend's speech at COP27, and especially his commitment to supporting green private finance projects. But does he agree with me that we should be supporting private firms who back all sustainable ESG principles, not just those exclusively pursuing net zero? <coughs> Yes, that is actually a very good point from my honourable friend, and we do need to have a broader approach to this, and that's what we will do as a government. There's a broad range of things that actually the UK is leading on when it comes to sustainability standards, and I look forward to getting his input on how best we can take that agenda forward. Gary Davis. Yes, the Prime Minister will know that every year 8 million people die from air pollution, 63,000 in Britain, and that by 2050 there will be as much plastic in the sea as fish. So will he firstly uh, invoke uh, World Health Organisation air quality standards in Britain as legally enforceable and encourage that in COP27, but also look at my plastics bill on the order paper today, which suggests we should not be exporting plastics, that manufacturers should pay the cost of recycling, and we should forge ahead with a global plastics treaty in COP27. Uh, well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased that air pollution has fallen significantly since 2010, including about a 40 per cent reduction in nitrogen dioxide. Uh, our Environment Act has new targets in place, and we've supported local authorities with about £800 million in funding to do that. And with regard to plastics, again, the Environment uh, Act means that we will ban more single-use plastics, charge for others, and have a new enhanced producer responsibility and a deposit return scheme. It is an incredibly ambitious agenda to reduce the amount of plastic in our system. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am proud that my Vauxhall constituency is leading the way with so many of my constituents concerned about global warming. My local council, Lambeth Council, was the first local authority in London to declare climate emergency, leading the way on policies to clean up the air. But we know that this action needs more than just local leadership, but national and international. So it was sad that the Prime Minister failed to show that by his reluctance to attend COP. So will he match the commitment from my constituents 
by showing his commitment and financing to help address this important issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have given that commitment, £11.6 billion in international climate finance. But as we've discussed, it's not just about what the government can do. We need private sector and private finance to help with the, uh, with the transition. And that's why all the changes we're making to the financial system are equally important, because that's where we'll unlock the trillions of dollars required. Andrew Jones. Speaker, across the world, economies are facing huge challenges caused by Putin's war in Ukraine. Does the Prime Minister agree that tackling climate change and achieving energy security are aligned and that the war in Ukraine has made progress on domestic sustainable energy production even more urgent? My uh, honourable friend is spot on. These two things go hand in hand. Greater energy security will help us meet our climate ambitions. We want cheaper, safer, cleaner forms of energy here at home, and that's what our plans are delivering. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister very much for his statement? Uh, I welcome the news that climate change remains a priority. But can I ask the Prime Minister, will he further assure this House that heating and eating for our elderly and vulnerable will also receive a priority? Whilst well, government seeks to be a good steward of the environment, and I welcome that, uh, government will also needs to help our own people to have the basic quality of life that they deserve in this great nation of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain, and Northern Ireland. I, uh, I, I join my honourable friend in paying tribute to those uh, elderly constituents and citizens that we have. It's right that they get extra help uh, over the winter with bills. That's why I pri- prioritise them with the announcements earlier this year on the cost of living payments, and it's why they receive a winter fuel payment. But they will always be uppermost in our mind because they're particularly vulnerable to cold, and we will make sure that we look after them. Speaker, nature is declining rapidly, with a million species at risk of extinction and deforestation accelerating in the Amazon and around the globe. And if we're to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, we must urgently halt and reverse its loss. So will you now support Labour's call for a net zero and nature test to align all public spending and infrastructure decisions with our climate and nature commitments? Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that's why I'm so pleased that one of our uh, signature achievements last year was to have countries accounting for 90 per cent of the world's forests to agree to reverse and halt land loss and degradation by 2030. We are playing our part in that. The announcements on Monday supporting the Congo were warmly welcomed, not just in that country, but by other countries in Africa, because they know that we are committed to this agenda. Grady. Mr. Speaker, he's very proud of the £11.5 billion that he keeps talking about that has been pledged. But when is that actually going to be dispersed? And if the aid budget is being cut, surely it's coming at the expense of other equally valid and equally important projects. And how on earth does slashing the 0.7 budget demonstrate the United Kingdom's Great Britain global soft power? Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the £11.6 billion is being spent over the period that it was outlined at the beginning, because it's right that we invest in the quality projects that can actually make a difference, not rush to get money uh, out of the door and waste it. Uh, But yes, I make no apology for having to make some difficult decisions as (coughs) Chancellor to ensure that our borrowing was on a sustainable trajectory. That's the right thing for this country. It's the right way to make sure that we can restrain the rise in interest rates, uh, and this country will always continue to play a leading role around the world. I'm proud that we are doing that. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, uh, President Zelensky has proposed an initiative for a global platform to assess the impact of military actions on the climate and environment, citing the impact of Russia's war on Ukraine as an example of war driving deforestation and renewed fossil fuel generation. Will the Prime Minister be supporting Ukraine's initiative at COP27? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was pleased to speak with President Zelensky on uh, my first day in office. Uh, he and I will remain in regular dialogue, and I'm sure we'll be discussing many ways which we can support Ukraine, uh, first and foremost, repelling the illegal Russian aggression that they are experiencing. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, given the rapid decarbonisation of the steel industry, there is no case, no business case, for the West Cumbria coal mine, which is on uh, his uh, colleague, the Secretary of State for Levelling Up's desk at the moment. But there was never a case for it when it comes to protecting our planet. We have to keep our fossil fuels in the ground, not digging them up and then burning them. He will be aware that for the third time now, this government has delayed the decision on whether to approve the West Cumbria coal mine until after COP26 and now until after COP27. We've been told there's a hard and fast date. The decision will be made by the 8th of December. Will his government stick to that promise or will they do the right thing and say no to a new coal mine? 
Mr Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentlemen know that these are quasi-judicial processes and it wouldn't be right for me to comment on them. I would like to thank the Prime Minister for his statement on COP27 and answering questions for just short of an hour. We are now moving on to the next statement, and I call Chris Heaton-Harris. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. With permission, I would like to make a statement on the issues arising from the failure of the devolved government of Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Executive, to form. Mr Deputy Speaker, the overriding priority of this government is to implement, maintain and protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Northern Ireland is governed best when governed locally. Since May, that has not been possible, but our commitment remains absolutely clear. This government believes that this is the moment for restoration of the devolved institutions and will work to that end as a matter of the utmost priority. My predecessors have all referred to critical times for Northern Ireland, and there have been many, but this year is indeed a critical one. Mr Deputy Speaker, you, I can see you are thinking that you might have heard those last, that last section of my statement before, and that is because you have. Those words were spoken by a former Secretary of State, the former member for Neath, at this dispatch box back in 2006. And whilst these times are different, with different issues affecting Northern Ireland, I and this government believe strongly that the people of Northern Ireland deserve a functioning assembly and executive, where locally elected representatives can address issues that matter most to the people that elect them. That is why, back in May, people cast their votes in Northern Ireland to give their communities a voice in Stormont. However, for six months, the parties have not come together, and on the 28th of October, the deadline to form an executive set down in law uh, the North, uh, uh, passed. That was the Northern Ireland Ministers' Elections and Petitions of Concern Act 2022. This is hugely disappointing. As a result, Mr Speaker, I am bound by law to call new elections for the Northern Ireland Assembly, as set out in New Decade New Approach uh, Agreement, that have to take place within 12 weeks of the 28th of October. Since the 28th of October, I have been engaging widely in Northern Ireland with the parties, businesses, community representatives, members of the public, and I have also spoken with other international interlocutors. I think it would be fair to say Mr. Speaker, that the vast majority of those uh, I have spoken to think that an election at this time would be most unwelcome. What people would welcome is having their devolved institutions up and running, because they are worried when they see a massive £660 million black hole in this year's public finances at the same time as their public services are deteriorating. They are worried that almost 187,000 people in Northern Ireland have been waiting over a year for their first outpatient appointment. And they are worried that there is a higher share of working age adults in Northern Ireland with no formal qualifications than anywhere else in the United Kingdom. There is also, Mr Deputy Speaker, legitimate and deep concern about the functioning of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And this is felt across Northern Ireland and very strongly indeed in the unionist community. The one thing that, gives, that everyone agrees on is that we must try and find a way through this current impasse, where I have a legal duty to call an election that few want and everyone tells me will, uh, will change nothing. Thus, I will be introducing legislation to provide a short, straightforward extension to the period of, for executive formation, extending the current period by six weeks to the 8th of December, with a potential for a further six-week extension to the 19th of January, if necessary. This aims to create the time and space needed for talks between the UK Government and the European Commission to develop and for the Northern Ireland parties to work together to restore the devolved institutions as soon as possible. As I stand here, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are, uh, the Northern Ireland Executive has no ministers in post. This means no ministers to make choices that deliver the public services people rely on, to, re uh, to react to the budgetary pressures facing schools, hospitals and other key services, to deliver the energy support payments that have been made available by this government to people across the rest of the United Kingdom. Before leaving his post, the Northern Ireland Finance Minister highlighted a £660 million uh, in-year budget black hole, but there are no ministers in the executive to address this. As civil servants do not have the legal authority to tackle these issues in, in the absence of an executive, I must take limited but necessary steps to protect Northern Ireland's public finances and the delivery of public services. 
So, as, be, as has been done before, the legislation I introduce will also enable Northern Ireland departments to support public service delivery, make a small number of vital public appointments like to the Northern Ireland Policing Board, and address the serious budgetary concerns I have already mentioned. And when so many are concerned about the cost of living in Northern Ireland, I know the public there will, will welcome a further measure I intend to address. An another matter addressed by the former Secretary of State, who I quoted earlier. People across Northern Ireland are frustrated that the members of the Legislative Assembly continue to draw a full salary whilst not performing all of the duties they were elected to do. I will thus be asking for this House's support to enable me to reduce MLA's salaries appropriately. Mr Speaker, let me end by repeating that the overriding priority of this Government is to implement, maintain and protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. This has been the bedrock of so much of the progress in Northern Ireland over the last quarter century. There are some, Mr Speaker, who have called for joint authority of Northern Ireland in recent days, and let me just say this will not be considered. The UK Government is absolutely clear that the consent principle governs the constitutional position of Northern Ireland, under which Northern Ireland is an integral part of the United Kingdom. We will not support any arrangements that are inconsistent with that principle. In addition, we remain fully committed to the long-established three-stranded approach to Northern Ireland affairs. As we approach the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, I found myself reflecting on the fact that political progress in Northern Ireland has so often required courage, understanding and compromise. I hope the measures I have announced in my statement today allow some extra time for these qualities to be displayed once again, and I commend it to the House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, and I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of the statement. Here in Westminster, our respective parties should strive to work together and build consensus with Northern Ireland whenever is possible. So I appreciate his efforts to inform me of developments over the weekend and in the period since the 28th of October deadline passed. Tony Blair was right when he called the peace process a responsibility that weighs not just upon the mind, but the soul. So I understand the difficulties the government is facing. When we talk about the elections in Northern Ireland, it is worth repeating that power sharing, as frustrating as it can be, is the essential and hard-won outcome of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and the principle of consent is fundamental to it. The fact that we have been without an executive since February damages that agreement that we all cherish. It has also hit public finances. The Independent Fiscal Council has been clear that the lack of executive has made it harder to manage the pressure of inflation. The cost of living crisis is hitting Northern Ireland particularly hard. The Government must urgently implement the support it has promised. If the Government delays any further, it must give the people of Northern Ireland an explanation beyond simply saying that it is complicated. The Labour Party has taken a constructive approach to the challenges posed by the absence of devolution. We have called for any of the three Prime Ministers in that time to use their great office to bring parties together. So can the Secretary of State confirm when the current Minister for the Union, also the Prime Minister, will be visiting Belfast? We have, also, uh, we have, been, we have, we have taken all parties on their own terms. Will the Secretary of State consider bringing all parties together in one room so they can hear the same message at the same time from him? We need everybody to be on the same page in the challenges that face Northern Ireland. And we have put forward solutions to the outstanding issues with the Northern Ireland Protocol. The politics, as well as the implementation of the protocol, are indivisible from the current impasse. Anyone who thinks differently is on a hiding to nothing. Even though the protocol forms part of the treaty between the UK and EU, Northern Ireland is, by definition, in the front line. The unionist community perceive it as an existential threat. Yet party leaders from both communities and the Alliance Party tell me they are not meaningfully updated, let alone consulted, on the UK's negotiations. The Secretary is still relatively new in the position. Will he turn a new page and find ways to bring Northern Ireland parties together and bring them in from the cold. As negotiations with the EU are so opaque, perhaps the Secretary of State could tell us if they are finally trying for a veterinary agreement. 
I met with all party leaders in the week before the 28th of October deadline, and I do not think that what they have said since has changed. There is great hope that the nature of negotiations with the EU has changed and that a deal is close. If this is indeed the case, the Government needs to update the House regularly and keep us updated henceforth. Three Secretaries of State in six months was never likely to lead to a sustained effort to restore Stormont. Chaos has consequences. More than any other part of our country, Northern Ireland is reeling from the Tory dysfunction here at Westminster. I have been clear that I will support the Government in delaying elections in extreme circumstances, but we need to hear what the time is going to be used for. This is the crux of the matter. The Government wasted the last six months, so what will they do in the next three we few weeks that they have brought themselves that they didn't do in the previous weeks running up to where we are now? If the coming period is to be fruitful, something different needs to happen. So rather than focusing on the technical aspects of the date changes, I would rather hear more from him about what he intends to use that time for. In the year since my appointment, this is the first statement on Northern Ireland, despite everything that's happened. Will the Secretary of State commit to keeping the House more updated on a regular basis than his predecessors? Northern Ireland deserves more than uncertainty, limbo and neglect. The Labour Party will always be an honest broker for Northern Ireland and we will work tirelessly to find the stability necessary for a bright future that is shared by all. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Secretary of State. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Honourable Gentleman for um, his constructive tone and the way we have worked together since I uh, took over this role. Um, and I welcome the fact that uh, he too noted what the Fiscal Council report issued yesterday has said and what it actually does mean in real terms, you know, how it explains what it means in real terms to have such a, a budget deficit in, uh, in Northern Ireland's um, finances uh, and the difficulties this, that this brings. He asked me about bringing all parties together and uh, I, I would be delighted to do so. Um, uh, the one thing I guess the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland can do is, 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 is convene. Um, there are lots of conversations to be had, and I know that the, all, all the parties are very willing to talk with me, and I hope they would all, all be very willing to talk with each other as well. So I shall absolutely take up that opportunity. But I also enjoy my individual conversations with them, and I, I, I do believe those to be very important indeed. Um, he asks about uh, updating the House or updating the Northern Ireland parties uh, uh, about the ongoing uh, talks and negotiations on the EU protocol. Firstly, this is not my negotiation to update the House on, it's the Foreign Secretary who is conducting the negotiations. And secondly, um, in my experience, in, uh, I spent a decade in the European Parliament and have now spent 12 years in this place. Um, I reckon it's probably quite unhelpful in many ways to write, uh, provide a running commentary on negotiations. But I understand the sentiment behind the ask that he made, and I will ask the Foreign Secretary to see what can be done to offer appropriate briefings to uh, the parties concerned. Um, the legislation I uh, will introduce intends to create the time and space needed for the talks between the UK and the European Union to develop and for the Northern Ireland parties to work together to restore the devolved institutions as soon as possible. And I think it's only right that as, the, as we move forward that I do update the House on, uh, on a regular basis on those matters. The Select Committee. Sam. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank my right honourable friend for his statement, welcome his proposals with regards to the pay cut, and add my agreement to his words that now is the time for bravery, leadership and a compromise such as we saw in the time period leading up to the signing of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Mr Deputy Speaker, my right honourable friend at NIAC said quite recently that with regards to the rubric of the formulation of the executive, that should be a bottom-up review rather than top-down. Could I just ask him to reflect on that, given the impasse that we are in and given the more than desperate requirement for functioning devolution for the people of Northern Ireland at a time of high inflation, interest rates and cost of living. Surely in the 21st century, no one party should have a veto on devolution. 
Um, I, I thank the Select Committee Chair for um, his, his words and uh, indeed the, the session, my first ever session as a, a Select Committee, uh, in, at the Select Committee a, a few weeks ago. And um, I, I do appreciate what he, what he uh, says in, in, in many ways, but um, the bedrock of the peace and prosperity that has uh, been um, in, has thrown, uh, flowed through Northern Ireland's veins for the last 25 years is the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. And in there, the, the three strands are absolutely clear about both consent and, and, and majorities. And, and, uh, uh, and so I would be, I mean, I, I do understand that there are various political parties now, and indeed others, now talking about how things might change in the future. Um, how reformation, uh, as he put it, uh, could, could occur. Um, and I know those conversations are taking place. But my job at this point in time is to, and I hope this, what this statement does, is to clear the space for uh, a period of time so we can get on with both, um, as I will keep reminding the House, um, give us the time and space needed for the talks between the UK and the EU to develop and for the Northern Ireland parties to work together to restore devolved institutions as soon as possible. Can I thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of his uh, statement? And I very much echo his sentiment that uh, Northern Ireland is governed best when it's governed locally. But I think it's also important to recognise that government and politics in Northern Ireland works best when there are good and productive relations also between London and Dublin and between the UK and the European Union. Now, Northern Ireland has been in the very unfortunate position of having both its governments paralysed by inaction over the past few months, albeit for different reasons. But we are very clear that we consider that the best place for MLAs to be and where we think the overwhelming majority of people in Northern Ireland would expect them to be is at work in Stormont holding a functioning executive to account as it gets on with overseeing the delivery of important public services. We do not think it serves the interests of people in Northern Ireland for there not to be an executive in place, but neither would it serve their interest to hold an election which, if it achieved, were to achieve anything, would only be to further entrench already well-dug positions. So we therefore look forward to seeing the legislation coming forward on the period for executive formation and to allow for essential decision-making to take place in the meantime and to allow for some long overdue negotiations to take place. But while we have been clear that the protocol is a necessary measure to protect Northern Ireland from Brexit, uh, we have also been clear that it is not unreasonable in light of experience for the UK Government to try and renegotiate that. So would the Secretary of State agree with me that in reaching any new settlement in the protocol, it can't only be about Northern Ireland, and that a revised settlement will only be a better settlement if it eases trades for all part of the UK, including UK EU export trading and environment, rather than just trade between GB and Northern Ireland. Um, I, I thank the uh, honourable gentleman for his contribution and, um, and, and again for his, his support. Um, and I completely echo uh, his view that actually uh, things best work when conversations are being had, and that's whether it's in the executive, uh, in the assembly in Northern Ireland, whether that is um, between uh, London and Dublin, and I'd like to think we have strongly reset that relationship in recent weeks, uh, or indeed with the United Kingdom and the European Commission. And again, I, I'd like to think we have strongly reset that relationship in a good place in recent weeks. Um, I understand his views are, um, about how we move forward. The key to everything, I believe, is actually um, uh, and I, I, is to try and make sure that we get the appropriate, the correct negotiated solution to the protocol. And I think all things that flow from that will be beneficial for us all. Benton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I can see why the Secretary of State is seeking to reduce the salaries of MLAs at the present time. However, he has opened a bit of a can of worms here. Does he not think it is ironic that Sinn Féin MPs are paid in full when they do not attend and take their seats in this House? Um, I understand the point the Honourable Gentleman has made, and I will swerve well away from it. <laughs> Donaldson. Thank you, yes. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, um, the, the Secretary of State is making this statement under provisions uh, laid out in the New Decade New Approach Agreement. 
And yet the only remaining part of that agreement that has not been implemented, honoured by this Government, is the most important one of all, restoring Northern Ireland's place in the UK internal market. We have had legislation passed on language and identity and other pieces of legislation, including the provisions that the uh, Secretary of State draws upon today. We recognise that the Government has brought forward legislation on the protocol, that is welcome, um, and that negotiations are ongoing. Can I just say to the Secretary of State uh, that the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement is based upon the principle of consensus, cross-community support. And when I he hear some members in this House saying that no one party should have a veto and praising the Good Friday Agreement, maybe they need to read the agreement again and recognise that it's cross-community. And the silence from some, when Sinn Féin held uh, no government in Northern Ireland for three years, they, they kept us without a government, and nothing was said. Nothing was said about removing the Sinn Féin veto. So let's be even-handed in this. And I, uh, in conclusion, say to the Secretary of State, words like courage, understanding, and compromise are fine and good words, but what the people of Northern Ireland need now and the sooner the better, is a solution that sees the institutions restored on the basis that Northern Ireland is an integral part of the United Kingdom, in line with Article 1 of the Belfast Agreement and in line with the Act of Union itself. Yeah, yeah, well done. <laughs> thank the right honourable gentleman for his words and his questions. And I, I hear exactly what he says. Um, he details where, uh, where legislation is in this place. I, 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 um, as he well knows, the protocol bill is... Uh, going through, uh, I believe, through committee now in um, uh, the House of Lords, um, unamended at this point. So um, uh, it is moving at a good pace. However, this government's preferred view is to have a negotiated solution with a, 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 a European partners, but you can see what we're aiming for within the content of that bill. I hear what he says about the history. I have, I've made that point myself to all, all people that have raised uh, those concern, uh, similar points with me, um, because I am aware of my history here, um, and I'm also aware of the responsibility that sits on my shoulders. Um, and I also am aware that the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, um, which is the 10th of April next year, should and could be a great day for uh, Northern Ireland, its politics, and um, its past, present, and future. And I look forward to working with him on all those matters. Bernard Jenkin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I um, very much welcome the bipartisan tone of these exchanges, that we need to look forward uh, without blame and with hope in our hearts <coughs> that we can restore power sharing and restore the working of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, but aren't we learning something from the state of the Northern Ireland Protocol. It's been in force for nearly three years. It's not actually been fully implemented and probably never will be. And might we not have to face the fact that, that for as long as the protocol exists and applies EU law in Northern Ireland directly, uh, it's increasingly unlikely that power sharing will be restored in Northern Ireland. And don't we need to look rather more grandly and strategically at this question with the Republic of Ireland, with our American allies, with the European Union and with all the parties in Northern Ireland about how to restore the functioning of the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah, I, I, I concur with uh, the, the sentiment behind my uh, honourable friend's uh, question. And, uh, he, and he mentioned a whole host of very, very important interlocutors in this, um, in, in this space. I actually... Um, Drawing on my experience of European institutions, do not believe that the protocol, when written, uh, was written in malice. I do believe it was meant, you know, it was, it was written in a, in, in a way that people believed it would work. However, the practicalities of it are absolutely obvious to all um, in Northern Ireland and in, in many, many different ways. Even its partial application is disrupting um, goods and the way people can go about their businesses. Uh, and has had some serious ramifications um, uh, for consumers and businesses in, uh, uh, across Northern Ireland. So it absolutely does need to be 
um, reformed, and this is now recognised by all of the parties in all negotiations. Colm Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I just say at the outset that um, I was never quiet when Sinn Féin uh, kept the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement down, and I will uh, challenge any party who tries to stop uh, the wishes of the, the people of Northern Ireland being properly uh, 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 implemented. Can I thank the, the Secretary of State for recognising that an election at this time is a bad idea, it would make things worse uh, rather than better, and recognise that there have to be arrangements put in place in the absence of an executive. But does he agree with me that it is actually pretty shameful that in the middle of winter, when people and businesses are panicking about their bills, we have one party who are stopping uh, a government being formed in Northern Ireland so that we can deal with those issues? Surely now is the time to put these arrangements aside, to have a DU the DUP Deputy First Minister go into Stormont and have an executive to deal with the priorities of the people. Where's the money? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think the